glycolysis is the process of taking glucose, one glucose molecule, and making two pyruvates. Yay! Pyruvates are pyruvic acids, right? Either one. Okay. Now, from that, pro where does this, where does this occur? Cytosol. Good. All right. And you get out of that, you get the two pyruvic acids. You also get two ATP, two ATP, and two and ADH. Good. Then the pyruvate, both of those pyruvates are converted to acetyl-CoA. And from that process, you also get what? You get two NADHs, right? Now, at this point, we've gone from the cytosol into the where? Yeah, into the mitochondria. Okay. And then the acetyl-CoA enters the, the both acetyl-CoAs go through the, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, right? And out of that, you get what? Two, two ATP or two GTPs, but ATP, yeah. And then you get how many NADHs? Six. Six of those. And how many FADH2s? Two. Two of those. Per acetyl-CoA, every time this cycle spins, okay, the acetyl-CoA is completely broken down into carbon dioxide. You bring that out. From that process, you get, per acetyl-CoA, you get one GTP, three NADHs, and one FADH2. How much ATP or GTP do we have at this point? Two. We got two ATPs and two, two, two GTPs. So most of the energy that was in the original glucose molecule is still in these electron carriers. These electron carriers are going to carry their electrons to the electron transport system or electron transport chain, again, depending on what, where you read. And that's where? Where in the mitochondria? Intermembrane. Yeah, it's along the inner membrane. All right, so we know about glycolysis, we know about getting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and we know about the citric acid cycle. What happens when, when glucose is broken down? The hydrogen atoms are ripped off the glucose, and energy is stored in those carbon-hydrogen bonds. And so what we're doing is we're slowly taking off a little bit of energy at a time. Remember we talked about the fact that you couldn't, you couldn't just burn glucose like you do gasoline because you get too much heat released and the cells would explode. So this process is taking off energy a little bit at a time. And so at the initial process, you get two ATPs, and you get a little bit of energy stored in these NADH molecules. What they're carrying, they're carrying those hydrogen atoms. But remember, a hydrogen atom is a proton plus a electron. And it's, your book talks about it being the hydrogen atoms, but it's really the electrons in the hydrogen atoms where the energy is. And so we call these... Your book calls them coenzymes, and that's what they are. They're also electron carriers. You can call them a bunch of stuff. They're not really high-energy compounds. That would be your ATP and your GTP, okay, the things that are phosphorylated. They carry the, the hydrogen atoms, which have the electrons in them there. Okay. And that's where, at this point, we still have energy, okay, potential energy, stored on these electron carriers. Okay. So at this point, we don't have a lot of ATP yet. Most of the energy, most of the chemical energy that was in the glucose molecule is stored on these electron carriers. And so those electron carriers, that energy is going to be used to make a lot more ATP. And that's what happens at the electron transport system. All right, so we're down to our very last step. Very last step. What, what is it that happens with these electron, tra uh, electron carrier molecules, the FADH and the N FADH2 and the NADH at the electron transport system? The electron transport system, or again, sometimes it's called an electron transport chain, is a series of molecules that are embedded in that inner, mitochondri inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember, our mitochondria has an outer membrane. It's got the inner membrane with the, what are the folds called? Christy. <laughs> okay. And so the electron transport molecules are embedded in that inner mitochondrial membrane. And so that's one reason why you have the folds, because it gives you more membrane to put more proteins in there, more electron transport molecules. Now, some of these molecules are called cytochromes. Now, the way electron transport works is it uses what are called redox reactions. Redox is a shortened word for reduction and oxidation. Now, when I say oxidation, you immediately think oxygen, right? The word oxidation has nothing to do with oxygen. It has to do with electrons. Redox 
redox reactions, oxidation and reduction has to do with electrons. If something is oxidized, it loses electrons. Something that is reduced, that means it gains electrons. Well, this is the way I remember it. What kind of charge does an electron have? So if you get negatives, you get reduced. In a cell, you always have to have these two things together. You can't have free electrons bouncing around. Electrons bouncing around in your cell is not good. That's why we have electron carriers. And so what happens when we take glucose and we convert it to pyruvate, we make two NADHs. We take electrons off of glucose and we put them on NAD to get NADH. So since NAD becomes NADH, electrons are added to that. We say that NAD gets... So that's a reduction reaction. That is a reduction reaction. Glucose gets oxidized because we're taking electrons off of it and we're putting them on NAD, NAD gets reduced. So oxidation, if you oxidize something, what do you do? You take off the, but you got then, if you gotta do something with those electrons, so you have to do what to something else? Reduce it, got it? So that's the, that's the oxidative part of this process. Moving electrons. Now, phosphorylation we've already talked about. Phosphorylation just means to add a phosphate group to. When, when our cells make ATP, we do that by taking ADP and adding a phosphate. And that gives you ATP. ADP has two phosphates? Mm -hmm. You add one, you get ATP, right? Okay. So phosphorylation is just adding a phosphate group to something. So what happens at the electron transport system is you're using the movement of electrons, that's the oxidative part, to drive the phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP. Oxidative phosphorylation is using redox reactions, movement of electrons, to power the phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP. Oxidative phosphorylation is using the movement of electrons, oxidation and reduction reactions, to power the production of ATP. Now, but that says a lot. You've got to remember that a redox reaction, in redox reactions, you're moving what? Electrons. And so that's where the oxidative part comes in. And to make ATP, you have to phosphorylate ADP. Now, when you make any kind of ATP or GTP, you do phosphorylation because you're adding a phosphate group, right? Okay. But this is a different kind of phosphorylation. You're not using electrons for that. Okay. That's why this is different. This process, this electron transport system, performs oxidative phosphorylation because you're using the electrons. And this is after the CREP? Yeah, this is, this is because what happens is in glycolysis, you generate these guys that are carrying electrons. Going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, you generate those. And then going through the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, you generate these guys. And so all of these guys are carrying what? Electrons. electrons. And so those electrons are going to be deposited over here on the ETS. And the movement of those, those electrons is going to help us generate ATP. Lots and lots and lots of ATP. So if you reduce something, do you add electrons or take them away? Yeah. Add. Good. All right. Remember hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron? So you take NAD, which has a positive sign, positive charge, you add two hydrogens, so you're adding two electrons. Okay, and so in, what happens is both electrons and one of the hydrogen protons gets, stays on this, and then you get a proton by itself. So it gets a hydrogen atom and one electron. NAD, so see how you, you still have the two hydrogen atoms. You still have the two protons. One of them's over here with two electrons, and then one proton's by itself. And so there, therefore you don't lose the, the, you have the same charge. The important thing for you guys to know is this is carrying two electrons and so is this. FAD carries, carries all of it. The important thing to remember is that both NADH and FADH2 are carrying two electrons, a pair of electrons. 
This one's carrying two electrons, this one's carrying two electrons. So here, I would have six, AD, six NADHs, how many electrons all together? Twelve. Twelve. Make sense? This one would give me four. four. Okay, good. All right, so let me show you how this works. The NADH and the FADH2 come over to the electron transport chain, and they drop the electrons off. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane. Here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here's the electron transport system. This would be the intermembrane space. This would be the matrix. Cytosol is out here, right? So NADH comes in, and what it does is it starts at the very beginning of this electron transport system. NADH dropped off what? Two electrons. Two electrons. So it becomes oxidized, and this first cytochrome becomes reduced. reduced. And so as these electrons move from one molecule to the next, it's a series of this will get oxidized, it gets reduced. This gets oxidized, this gets reduced. This gets oxidized, this gets reduced. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, remember the slinkies? Yeah. And you started, you started the slinkies at the top of the stairs, and they walked their way down? That's kind of what's going on with these electrons. They're just going to bounce from one thing to the next. The cool thing that happens, though, when they do that, when this pair of electrons moves to this next thing, what happens? Um, two protons, two hydrogen ions, move from the matrix to the intermembrane space. So we had electrons dropped off by NADH. It became NAD. It's going to go back and get some more electrons. Electrons move from here to here. Two protons get pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Then, as these electrons move to the next one, what happens? Same thing. Two more protons get pumped. And then finally, the electrons move to the end, and what happens? So, per NADH molecule, how many protons get pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space? Six. NADH, when it drops off its pair of electrons and they bounce around through the electron transport chain. They cause six protons, or six hydrogen ions, to be pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space. The NADH is an electron carrier. It carries these electrons that were originally on glucose, right? Carries those electrons to the electron transport system, and the movement of those electrons basically translocates, pumps those protons out. It's the energy of those, of those electrons bouncing down that electron transport chain that moves those hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space. FADH2, it's carrying electrons, right? Sure. But it cheats. FADH2 skips the first step. It skips the first cytochrome on the electron transport chain. Now, the result of this is the fact that because it skips the step, it still drops off two electrons. But because this first protein is skipped... Then when those electrons move, how many protons get pumped? Four. Four instead of six. Okay. FADH2 skips a step. So when FADH2 drops off its pair of electrons, only four protons get pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Now, here's the deal. The slinky, the electrons are at the bottom of the steps. We can't just have electrons hanging out by themselves. This is where your cells use oxygen. When the electrons bounce down the electron transport chain, protons get pumped, and then oxygen catches the electrons, and it gets reduced to water. This is why your cells need oxygen. This is why you have to breathe. Because your mitochondria use oxygen to catch the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. That's what oxygen is for. Oxygen is what is called the terminal electron acceptor, or some textbooks call it the final electron acceptor. That is what oxygen does. It catches the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. If you don't have oxygen, it's your cells can't make ATP, or they can't make very much of it. They can make a little bit of it. They can make those two right there. In fact, if there's not enough oxygen around, that's all the ATP your cells can make from a molecule of glucose. If oxygen is present, then the pyruvate goes where? Into the, into the mitochondria. And then it gets converted to acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA enters the 
Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle or spread. And you get a whole bunch of this stuff, right? And then these things and those things and those things carry the electrons to the electron, electron transport chain. And electrons bounce around. And finally, the oxygen catches those electrons at the end. If there is oxygen present, all of this happens. In that order. In that order. If oxygen is not present, this then is all that happens. happens. Right. Oxygen is the what catches the electrons. It accepts the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. That's what I mean by final electron acceptor. It is the molecule that accepts the electrons once they bounce down the electron transport chain. It catches the electrons, it becomes water. It is reduced to water. Now, I got a bunch of protons here. What do they want to do? I got a concentration gradient, don't I? Yeah, they want to come back in, right? All right, now we're going to finally make the ATP. The movement of these protons back into the mitochondrial matrix drives a protein that makes ATP. That process, the use of this proton gradient, or these hydrogen ion gradients, to make ATP is called chemiosmosis. <laughs> chemiosmosis is just the, the word that describes using the movement of these protons to make ATP. So here are my six protons that NADH was able to drop the electrons off and get pumped out, right? Okay. So when those six protons move back in, six protons moving back through drives this enzyme called ATP synthase. It's a channel protein plus an enzyme that adds a phosphate to ADP. That molecule right there is ATP synthase because it synthesizes, it makes ATP. The movement of these protons is like, like water moving a turbine. That movement spins, changes the shape of this protein, and it allows it to put a phosphate on ADP, just like water turns a turbine to make electricity. As, as the protons pass through, this thing changes shape, okay. and, and it allows it to basically smack that phosphate group onto ADP. Basically, every two protons that come through, this thing spins and makes an ATP. So if six protons come through, how many ATPs are made? Three. Because every two protons that come through spin the wheel. The ADP gets a phosphate group added to it to make ATP. So for every six protons that come through, three ADPs are phosphorylated to make three ATPs. Okay, now that's with NADH. What about FADH2? Now, how many protons does FADH2 pump out? Four. Four. So how many ATPs am I going to get per FADH2? Two. 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 Because here I've only got four of these, right? Four come in, and so I get two ADPs converted to two ATPs. Okay.